chain of the past. You've broken into over fear, over lies. We're singing the truth that nothing is impossible. Every giant will fall. The mountains will move. Every chain of the past. You've broken into over fear, over lies. We're singing the truth. Then nothing is impossible with you. No greater name, no higher name, no stronger name than Jesus. You overcame, broke every chain, forever reign. King Jesus, no greater name, no higher name, no stronger name. Then Jesus, you overcame, broke every chain, forever reign, King Jesus. Every giant will fall, the mountains will move, every chain of the past, you've broken into over fear, over lies, we're singing the truth. Then nothing is impossible. Every giant will fall. The mountains will move. Every chain of the past you've broken into over fear, over lies. We're singing the truth. Then nothing is impossible with you. You make this sinner holy and holy. Holy. Because your glory is so beautiful. I fall onto my knees in awe. You are good. 
Set the rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. Need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. Refuse to waste our lives. For you're our joy and prize. To see the captives' hearts released. The hurt, the sick, the poor at peace. We lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We are your church. We pray revive this earth. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire, win this nation back, change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here. We pray, unleash your kingdom's power, reaching the near and far, no force of hell can stop. Your beauty changing hearts. You made us for much more than this. Awake the kingdom seed in us. Fill us with the strength and love of Christ. We are your church. We are the hope on earth. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here. We pray. Clap your hands. All ye people, shout to God with the voice of triumph. Clap your hands. All ye people, sing for joy unto the Lord. Singing Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Jesus Christ is the Lord of all, Lord of all the earth. Jesus Christ is the Lord of all, Lord of all the earth. Jesus Christ is the Lord of all, Lord of all the earth. Jesus Christ is the Lord of all, Lord of all the earth. Clap your hands, all ye people. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. Clap your hands. 
all ye people, sing for joy unto the Lord, singing hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Jesus Christ is the Lord of all, Lord of all the earth. Jesus Christ is the Lord of all, Lord of all the earth. Jesus Christ is the Lord of all, Lord of all the earth. Jesus Christ is the Lord of all, Lord of all the earth. Jesus Christ is the Lord of all, Lord of all the earth. Jesus Christ is the Lord of all, Lord of all the Some call you Mama. Some call you Mommy. Some call you the most smartest. Some call you so funny. Some call you homework helper. Some call you higher, higher. Some call you their hero, and also their taxi driver. Some call you Nana, or Abuela, or Mima. Some call you Mother, please stop spoiling them all. Some call you a mentor. Some call you a friend. Some call you God's kindness for the mother they never had. Some call you from the beginning. Some call you much later. Some call you guardian or foster parent on paper. But paper never stopped you from showing up open-handed. You were no less the mother and the love God intended. Some call you joy, some call you graceful, some call you strength, some call you faithful, some call you constant, some call you care, some call you always, some call you there. Some call you the greatest, some call you the bomb. But I, I call you blessed. I call you
Good morning, y'all. So, mom. Okay, I dig it. So, there's a change the way it used to be muffins with mom. There's no with this year. It's four. Okay? So, all of us who had those almonds, beautiful muffins, and Jeanette standing guard over those uh, diligently out there, four moms. So, the elders actually, I believe, are going to be handing out, they will be prayed over. Okay, so they will be blessed muffins, just like our mothers. So whether you're called mother, mama, nana, things that were listed up here, grandma, granny, or even Meg G. Tron, it happens. Go get your muffin, seriously. We appreciate, again, this video was, was absolutely touching, uh, but there's no word, one word that describes our mothers to us or those that, that raised us in, in our mom's plays. As we go throughout this week, throughout today, throughout the rest of our lives, actually, there's something I was uh, listening to, a book I was listening to uh, by Louis Giglio called At the Table with Jesus. And Giglio shared something about a verse that I, like many of us, have grown up with, <clears throat> seen at sporting events, and that's John 3.16. may have blown over it so much because it's been that, even though it's been a core verse, it is something that speaks volumes to us, it's... It's out there, and it's out there a lot. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. What Giglio was focusing on is that word have. And I'm no Bible scholar by any stretch. I know there's been several thoughts on this verse over the years by others much smarter than me, of course, which doesn't take much. But the focus what Giglio again was sharing was have, not will have, not will inherit, not will achieve, but have. The simple verse shares that when we believe in Christ, we have eternal life, we possess it. And I know as disciples of Christ that we follow him into his death, his burial, and his resurrection. But again, we have because of his sacrifice. How amazing is that? We are given freely the gift of eternal life by believing that Jesus is God's son and that he is actually God himself. We cannot earn, we, can, we have. Let's keep that in front of our minds as we have all the other noise that's going to hit us today, this week, the rest of our lives. We have the gift of eternal life from the creator of all because of the once and for all sacrifice of his son. We're saved. So let's do that together this morning. 
I'll be reading from Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. All right, after that amazing singing this morning, it's time to light it up. So when you say good morning, it's like first. Make sure you say happy Mother's Day. But also tell them, what is your most prized possession? Go say good morning.
Good morning, church. When I was thinking about the, the focus for this morning and some of the words I wanted to share to you, with you this morning regarding communion, I was thinking about that common root word in the word communion, in the word community. It's common. I started thinking about all the things that we as a fellowship, as members of God's kingdom, have in common. And I wanted us to remind us about just a couple of things, and these are simple things, but they're the core for us. They're the things I want us to remember as we gather as a group and commune with each other. The first thing I want us to think about here today is that we're here to worship the only being worthy of praise, the creator, the sustainer of the universe. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. A holy trinity that is the epitome of unity and communion. As a society, I think we've gotten enamored with the amazing things that we've, been, that we've accomplished over the last hundred years or so, from space travel to artificial intelligence. But it seems like for many of us, it's led to the loss of awe, fear, and reverence, and wonder of just who God is. The God who set the world in motion, who established all the laws of science that we think we discover, who grants us wisdom and knowledge to do all the things that we do. So I'm asking you today, Take some time to rediscover how significant he is and how insignificant we are. Take time, marvel again at his majesty. Go out, stare at the stars, the millions of stars in the sky. Go spend time looking over a field of flowers. If you have time, go experience the mountains. Go stand in front of an, the ocean that seems to be infinite. Think about the God that created all of this and know this, that God knows who you are and everything about you. The second thing I want us to remind us is we're all here and we all have talents that God has gifted us with. And those talents were given to you for the purpose of building up this congregation. Remember the parable of the talents. God expects us to use all the gifts he gave us. You better than most know what these things are. But if you don't, then ask God to reveal them to you because you are needed, they are needed this body needs you for encouragement, for support, for admonishment, for teaching, to love, to hope, to inspire. You are needed, and God has given you special gifts and talents to do just that. The final thing I want to remind us of this morning is why we're here, gathered now. We're all sinners in the presence of a holy God. No matter if you've been in church your whole life or if this is the first time you're here, not one of us on our own can stand before him. But the good news and the reason we gather and celebrate this feast this morning is that the God who created the universe, the significant, cares so much about the insignificant that he has pursued us from the day, the, the moment man separated himself from him. The creator came down to the created. He served the created. He died for the created so that we can be saved. This is called grace, and it's through this we can and will be saved. Nothing we can do on our own makes us right with God. God's done the work, the impossible work. We just need to acknowledge him, love him, obey him, not because we're trying to earn his salvation, 
because he's the only true being worthy of these things. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you in awe because we, the insignificant, don't understand why you, the significant, care so deeply about us. But we know you, all, you do. We know you sent your son. He came here and his body was broken for us. And we're so thankful for that. All this we pray through your son's name. Amen. Let's pray for the cup. Lord, we come before you now, thanking you for the blood that was shed for us, that was spilled on our behalf to wash us clean. Again, we don't understand it, but we accept your grace freely. All those who pray through your son's name, amen.
now take this time to give back to God just a small portion of what he's blessed us with. Let's, let's bow. Lord, we come before you. With a small gift, we know that nothing we can give back could ever pay all you've given us. But Lord, we offer this to you as worship. We ask that you bless these gifts. Make it flourish your kingdom. Make it grow your kingdom. Thank you so much for all the blessings that you've bestowed on us. Through your son's holy name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, church. The next scripture reading is from 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Good morning. Let me just um, <clears throat> echo the sentiments of uh, the husbands and the uh, sons and everybody else who has conferred blessings and well wishes upon the mothers. Mothers, happy Mother's Day. Hope you guys enjoyed a good and hearty breakfast cooked by your significant others and hope you are ready and waiting for a sumptuous lunch provided for or paid for uh, by significant <laughs> others. 
We've been um, <clears throat> on a journey uh, considering the theme of worship. And um, if you are uh, new to this assembly, if you are visiting this morning, uh, let me just sort of uh, catch you up before we give you um, uh, a illustration of one of the items, one of the themes that we've been unpacking. So worship, we contend, as the scriptures contend, is not something that we do for 30 minutes on a Sunday. Worship is broader, broader in terms of the definition. And so um, we started off with Cain and Abel, if you remember it. And um, we looked at their life as an offering before they brought uh, their gifts. And then we meandered to... Um, Adam and Eve, uh, the helper, the ones placed in the garden, the ones given stewardship and charge over uh, creation. And we saw how that their work was actually worship. And we were minded to put this into practice, not just theoretically speaking, and reading texts and going about our business, but that we actually had uh, shirts uh, a couple weeks ago, Be the Church. And we, we went to work, and we offered up our work as, as worship. And so take a gander at this video as we, we reflect upon uh, this idea of worship being work. that song but I love the uh, worship experience even more and so this is more akin to what Adam and Eve did um, they went out they took care of stuff and 
uh, in Nicaragua, there are people who will receive meals that we packed, and they will glorify God. In uh, backyards around Garland, there are people who will walk out and behold a fence that you guys put together, and they will worship and praise God. And so we do not want to get stuck in talking about what the church ought to be like or to look like. We want to experience. And so I know it puts you in a very precarious position because if you've heard all your life, worship is just 30 minutes on a Sunday, then you might not be so eager to come on a Sunday to do worship like you've, you've just seen. But we still love you. And we want you to push through that discomfort so that you could understand, so that you could see, and so that you could taste what the Lord has prepared for people who are partners with him in this ministry of reconciliation. And so this morning, we'll be talking about Abraham and Isaac going to worship. And if you are minded on the activities of, for Mother's Day and you just can't concentrate this morning, I want to give you the thesis before we get into our worship this morning in terms of reading text, in terms of inviting the Holy Spirit to illumine our understandings. Question is, do you want to worship God? And if that's a yes, then you ought to return your children, your spouses, your family, your most prized relationships to him. Offer up every last one. Do you want to worship God is our thesis this morning. And the answer is, if so, you want to offer up your kids, your spouses, your family, and every last prized possession that we term as relationships. Now please join me in standing on a reading of our text this morning. Genesis chapter number 22, verses 1 to 14. And as you read, I want God to work with you. Because you're not here to listen to me. You're here to listen to God's word. It has the power. It has the gifting. So receive the gifting. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here am I, he replied. Then God said, Before we, to go to, before we go to verse 8, I want you to soak in what you've just read. I'm in no rush this morning, by the way. We will get finished on time, but I'm not rushing this. God said, take your son. Did you see that? Your one and only son. Did you see that? He said, go to the region of Mount Moriah. Go to the mountain." He loads the donkey. Verse 4 says, on the third day. Yeah, that's interesting. Notice in verse 6, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on who? His son. Who carried the wood? His son. The wood that he would be laid on. He's carrying it. Verse 8, Abraham answered, God himself,
will be provided. Amen. Maybe have your seats. I don't want you get I don't want you to get accustomed to listening to people and their thoughts. I want you to be fixated on the word of God and read it and pause, Sela, read it and pause, Sela, and ask God to help you to understand what you read. Men tell on themselves through standardized definitions. And so our definition for worship in the American dictionary use words like personal, personal devotion, inward orientation, reverence, respect. But if you would go to a French dictionary, the word for worship, occulte, has to do with public activities and public places. So right off the bat, the writer Dearness explains to us that the personal character of worship that we as Americans take for granted hardly appears anywhere else. So if you're reading the biblical text, you understand that a lot of things has been imposed on the biblical text when it comes to worship and a definition of worship. And our tendency to interpret faith in personal terms, you know, my faith, my Christianity has been gifted to us by the Puritans, by the Reformation movements, and also in terms of personal salvation and appropriating God for ourselves and these activities for ourselves, we get those from them. I get that. But then the light, enlightenment comes along and it gifts us with being autonomous, autonomy, and being self-creating. So that means that you get to decide who to give up in terms of relationship and to what extent. This is a sermon about relationships. This is a sermon about giving up every relationship that you hold dear into the redeeming hands of God. And so if you remember in Genesis 12, which comes before Genesis 22, the creator is talking to Abraham, who will soon be called Abraham, and he says these words. Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will make your name great. I will bless you. And all the peoples of the earth, all these relationships are going to be blessed through you. But through my power working through you. So God says, I, 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 over and over again, I am the one who's going to be doing this. And what is Abraham's response? He went. Worship is about what God is doing for you and yours. You all are called to respond to the gift of participation in God's plan. Now, with an invitation, you don't get to plan or determine menu or protocol, right? You simply show up with your plus ones. And so, if you have a party or, say, a graduation and you send out invites and no one shows up, you will feel a bit slighted or, or even irritated. But God is saying, worship me. By coming with all the gifts that I have blessed you with, and many times we don't show up. I mean, we're supposed to be responding like the Israelites who never really got it right all the time. But every member in their family Every, every child, every, every spouse, every worker, every Levite had to be dedicated back to God in terms of their relationships. And you might say today, well, you know, I don't, I don't have children. This is not just about people with children. This is about people with relationships. It's more than optics. Well, you know, if you're here every Sunday, every Wednesday, then we know that you are giving your relationships back to God. But in John chapter 2, I remember... People who saw the signs that Jesus did. John says, John chapter 2, from verse 23 following. And it says that they, they glorified him. And then the very next line says, 
Jesus did not trust or commit himself to man. You know why? Because he knew what was in us. So optically speaking, he's not looking on the surface. He's looking even deeper than that. And so this is not a sermon about church attendance with regularity. Optics. Because anyone can get by with optics with a deeper pain and gangrene festering. And so how we grow our kids, what we teach them about faith, what we put in front of faith formation, our relationship goals, how does God, God's will get to, to color and, and shade those relationships? You know, the NCAA is not going to make concessions for you and I. You know, our schools are not going to make concessions for you and I. If you can show up, they will have something going on. Now, let me just say, before I go forth, I am not talking about you being involved in sports and being away on a Sunday, although that is incorporated in it. I'm just saying we need to look deeper to figure out the things that we give our kids to, the things that we give up our relationships to. Are they redeeming? Are they spiritually forming those relationships? This only find clarity in the sacrificing to the will of God. Sports, education, building their fortune, then what? Happiness, joy in a relationship, having fun, then what? You see, God is clear about sacrificing. He is not an Indian giver. The one who gives the gifts of relationships knows how to direct and purge them for the goodwill of participants. But he cannot do that if we are minded on keeping them and on directing them and enjoying them as we please. So as you look at this text again, notice the language of sacrifice. Notice the language of sacrifice of the one that God has called and says, I am going to bring these things, fulfill these things through your obedience. And he's gifted him with family and a one and only son Isaac. And then he says, hey, um, I need that back. Now, this is where it gets interesting. And this is where I can't afford to lose anybody at this point. Because this is where the sermon actually begins. Notice the language of sacrifice. Wood, burnt offering, fire, knife, altar, bound in a sun, knife to slay as they are traveling as they get ready to travel there is this sharpening of the knife and it's not really a knife because the wood is actually more adjacent to a meat cleaver that a butcher would use and then there's violence because he's splitting the wood it's the language it's the tone it is the atmosphere of sacrifice and I'm wondering, even in our relationships, what are the things that we've seen? What are the things that we've heard calling us to give those up to, to God? But there's also a silence of Abraham's feelings. If you read the entire text, as we've just read verse 1 to verse 14, the only question that is asked is, of, is from Isaac, who says, Father, you know, I ain't seen the, the sacrifice. But then he, he's not asking in resistance. He's asking, fully trusting that his father has a plan and his goodwill at heart. There's no hint about how sorrowful Abraham feels. There is no idea conveying his anger or how could God ask me to do this? There's no kickback. Even when God says, all right, okay, I believe you now. You can slow down. Don't kill the boy. There is no, ah, oh, 
sigh of relief. There is no joy or, 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 or tears. Oh, I'm so grateful. There is no jubilation. There is only a change of knowledge and decision in the mind of God. That's called an anagnorisis. And you can take it down, you can write it, you can look it up. But basically, in different literary, literary writings, novels and such, at different points, the principal character gets to know something about the true nature of another character. The other characters have no color in terms of feeling and emotion. The only thing that you get to know in the text is that the principal character gets to know something about another character. And so, Jean-Louis Scar says this about the text and anagnosis. Nobody knows of Abraham, his inner feeling, not even the God that appears in the narrative. The real meaning is the active participation of the reader in the appalling quandary of a father asked to offer his son in Holocaust to the very divinity that first promised and afterwards granted him his son. The meaning of the text depends to a large extent on the quality of the reader's participation in the patriarch's predicament. So, you are asking yourself, what does that mean? Reflecting on these words, consider the cross of Jesus. Reflecting on these words, consider Jesus dying. Many folks go to this text and they are appalled by the seemingly tainted presence of child sacrifice. But as you've just read about the wood and the three days and uh, your son and your one and only son, you understand that this text calls you to a deeper idea, a, a deeper wrestling. How do you participate in this? Because we have no idea what Abraham thought. We just know that he followed through and then God said, aha, no, I know. But God, is it that you did not know before? An agnosis. That point when the principal character in a novel or a play or literary writing gets to know something about another character. And the only answer that we have similar to this predicament is a man called Job. Job 1, from verse 20, we read, after Job had lost everything he had gotten from God, and in his feelings he was trying to figure things out. He, his world unfurls. He loses his daughters and his sons die and his servants and livestock all gone. And even in trying to figure out his feelings in the verbiage, he says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be. So Job says, The things that you have from God, the relationships, you should hold them gently. You should hold them gently because his ways are not our ways. So how do you respond to God's sovereignty in the matter? We've heard the text. You've been told, you've been instructed that you are to put yourself by way of participating in your life into this text and the relationships, the Isaacs, that you hold. How do we respond to God's sovereignty in the relationships he has gifted us? 
And usually there are two different types of, types of polar opposite responses. We feel entitled to keep these or we have enough trust to, to give them away. And in that giving away, if you consider Job, he's like, man, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why this happened, but I came with nothing. And everything I have is not because of my sweat equity. And I am going with nothing. And the relationships I can see and I cannot see, God holds, God preserves, God sustains. And I am not God. But I'm speaking to people, including, including myself, who are in the fishbowl of an American culture that tells me that I get to decide, and I get to hold, and I get to keep, and I get to, 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 I get to determine the value and the valuable. I get to determine the faith formation of my son, and my daughter. I get to determine how much they read scripture and how much they do not read scripture. I get to determine how much time they spend in the presence of God. All these things are my choosing, my doing. And if you look at American culture, it is not the exception to the rule. See, the rule is if we have space, if we have time, we will fit those relationships into an hour or half an hour with God. But other than that, it's all ours. I have a plan for my kid. He has to be successful. You know, what do you think about the children that God gave you? About the spouses? Those under your influence, those on your bankroll, those you are married to, those you are dating. Those you have relationships with, your most treasured relationships can possess you. So I bring God says, give it all up. Because you can't give a kid education and you can't give a kid security. But what is education and security without knowing your God? And I don't think we will ever worship until we let go of our relationships. Until we see them as gifts, not as a right, not as deserved blessings, not as the things that we own. My wife, my children, my relationships. And it's easy if your spouse has not gone to be with the Lord. It's easy to say, oh yeah, that's right, Brother Robbie. Give them up. But what about the person who has lost a wife or or a son, or a daughter. Do you think that is easy? Well, it's easy if you've given your kids everything and they don't want for a meal, or for a sneaker, or for a trip. What about people who grow up in poor neighborhoods and the only escape they have is football or basketball or soccer or some other thing? Can you tell them, well, give that up and always be poor? It is easy to say, give up your relationships, but then you get into the quandary of life and you understand that it is actually not easy. But it is necessary if you want to follow the living God who is sovereign, whose ways are not our ways thoughts are not our thoughts. So the other words, as we, as we seek to, to wind down, the other words of one who has been where Abraham trotted, one who speaks for many of us in here today. I spoke of Charles when I first moved here about a year and some ago. Charles was a friend of mine, ministry partner, musician, um, Died of cancer, age of about 34, left his wife, Erin, as you see, and three kids. This past week, she had a birthday, and um, I would just like to read to you what she posted. 
complicated. This is the word I have used for nearly every occasion since January 8th, 2021. To be honest, I'm a bit miffed that I still have to use it, but it turns out that things that were once naively free of duality just are no more. And there's no going back to the state of being. For example, first day of school pictures generate thoughts like, I am so proud of my kids and they are growing up so quickly and also, he should be here. And who else cares about these first day of school photos in the way their dad would? Christmas. The snow and twinkling lights are beautiful. I love the Christmas music season. Jesus has come and also his chair is empty at our holiday meals. And there is so little laughter compared to when he was with us. Taking a photo on my phone. I am so grateful for photos and the gift of memories. And also every new photo I take moves his face farther away from my camera roll and harder to just stumble across. Add to the list of complicated things my birthday. I kidnapped her once to get together for a yurt on the edge of the boundary waters in order to avoid any sort of birthday surprise at all. And yet, something about seeing how short life is and how quickly anyone and anything we treasure can disappear also opens your eyes to a need to celebrate the small things the gift of every year you are given. So today, like every day, it is complicated. I enter a new decade, one my beloved never lived to see. I enter this decade without him here to wrap, his, to wrap me in his arms and tell me I am old as dirt and ask me what the dinosaurs looked like. I have lived 850 days without him here and I have missed his presence in every single one and yet simultaneously I'm grateful to live to 40 to have seen 850 days of my kids growing up to be sent a table full of flowers from people who know and love me to have our French foreign exchange student baked me a cake and eat Mexican with my parents who are still living to see this day. To be here at 40 to wrestle with God. To learn to surrender and love and follow grace upon grace. It's all complicated and intertwined as a ball of yarn, dear friends. And for whatever years I'm given here, I'm going to live fully into that messy reality Thanks for marking this day with your texts, gifts, flowers, messages. You all make this life beautiful. Forty years old, if you're asking me, you should live with your beloved till you guys are 80, 90, 100. If you ask me, Charles would still be in the house helping her raise Two beautiful girls and a beautiful boy. But he's not. And unlike Abraham, more like Job, she shares her feelings. And as she posts her banner on Facebook, it reads, Be the reason someone believes God is good. Do you want to keep your relationships? Because they're not yours. They are gifted to you. And everything gifted, God expects you to sacrifice back to him because he knows what to do with all of them. He knows how to honor them. He knows how to bless them. He knows how to keep them safe from the meddling hands of eternity. And he knows how to bring reconciliation even when our spirits leave this fragile tent that we all know is passing away with every tick of the clock. So the question this morning is, what will you do with your relationships? Will you make them idols unto yourself? 
unto sports, unto education, unto money, unto prestige, unto comfort, unto pleasure, unto satisfaction. What are you going to do with your relationships? Because I am involved and I see other people involved in protecting their relationships from the God with whom their soul has business. So back to the thesis. How do you worship God? giving up your relationships to him so that he can inform them so that he can direct them so God sacrificed his son for us many times we sacrifice our sons our Isaacs our daughters our most prized relationships to idols the things of the world that will not last. And you know they will not last. And that's the whole thing. We know how the story ends. But we're so jaded by the fishbowl that we cannot tell our left hand from our right hand. And so as you stand to your feet and Ty gets ready for our song, I want to invite you, if you've not given up yourself, firstly to God, then we have water and we have word. We can take care of that today. I've seen moms give up so much for their kids. And it's fitting on mothers that reference God's nature as mom. Giving up his son for all his kids. And you think you are following that cross and that sacrifice to keep anything. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for today, for all the mothers that are here and for their sacrifice. We give you thanks for your text that invites us to, to walk in the way of Abraham and to listen to your voice, guiding us to that place where everyone will be blessed. And as we come to know ourselves in you, Help us to hold on gently to everything that you have given us. Because as you give and as you take away, we still understand that you are sovereign. That we are not God. That you are God. And we submit ourselves under this understanding this morning. Walk with us. And make us bear it, Heavenly Father, unto eternity. For Christ's name, the church says, Amen. Amen. There is love that came for us. Come on to the sinner's cross. You brought my shame and sinfulness. You rose again victorious. Faithfulness of men denied.
you as your children, knowing that you provide what we need, the love, the comfort, and the peace. If we turn our lives over to you, Lord, this time we lift up Jim and we ask for physical healing for him. And we pray that you be with Pam and her kids and grandkids as they deal with uh, the fear I just want to remind everyone that we would love for you to join us for class. Uh, they're out there on the screen. But also want to say it is Mother's Day. I want to say Happy Mother's Day to, to everyone out here. Uh, but Mother's Day can stir up a lot of different emotions in many people. Um, maybe your mother who's lost a child, or maybe someone who's lost her mother at work. Maybe your mother that's made a decision that you wish you would have made. Regardless of the situation you're in, the Lord loves you so much. <coughs> We also want to say that as your children grow to the mothers online, those that are good here, we rise and 